Highlands Rewilding embodies a mission of hope. Hope that science-driven rewilding can restore nature in Scotland and beyond and help local communities thrive. In our open-air laboratories, our intensive research helps to develop land management systems that show how natural capital can be grown verifiably for people, planet and profit. We are looking for investors who can help scale our operations to rewild and re-people Scotland. Please get in touch to find out more. Hello and welcome back to Story Red Podcasts. Me, your host Jack Carr. So today I'm joined by Dr. Penelope Whitehorn and Dr. Callum Brown up in Scotland, who can be telling us about their fantastic work that they've got going on regarding uh, Highlands Rewilding. So both to both of you, thank you so much for your time and welcome. We we'll start by telling us a little bit about your backgrounds and uh, how it is that you came to be working up in Scotland uh, today. Yep, sure, I can start with that one. So we job share the role of chief scientist at Highlands Rewilding, and I'm personally an ecologist. I've got quite a varied background. So I've worked from consultant ecology, doing work with bats and otters, etc., to more broad scale biodiversity monitoring in eastern Africa. Um, but more recently, um, I've worked in academia for many years, where my research focused on bumblebees and other pollinators and the effects that climate change and land use change has on them. So it's really nice to get back to a very much more applied role at Highland Tree Wilding. And I'm the other half of the chief scientist role. Um, my background is uh, from this area, actually, where I now work. I grew up close by um, Bunloit Estate, where Highland Tree Wilding um, has one site, and was always interested in conservation and nature. Um, eventually did a PhD in tropical forest ecology, actually, so a little bit more remote from Scotland, but then spent many years doing uh, research science on the ways that people use land and natural resources and how that interacts with climate change, biodiversity loss, and how we can do things differently to tackle those challenges um, in the future. And again, like Penelope, this was a chance to come come back home in my case and and apply those things in in real practical conservation rewilding projects um so great opportunity to to try that out that's it thank you so much and because it's already come up a couple of times would you mind telling us a little bit about what, it, what we feel it is that uh rewilding practices currently are in terms of how you're uh implying them um or your projects yeah, so rewilding is never an easy thing to define, and I think many people define it in lots of different ways, but basically it's the restoration of natural processes in increasingly complete ecosystems. And at one end of the scale, this is about restoring native ecosystems with little or no human um, management, but that really is quite the extreme end of the scale, so further down in more managed landscapes where there are more people around, there's a load of practices that can be incorporated into rewilding, such as regenerative agriculture and sustainable forestry. So the outcomes are always quite forward looking and creating robust ecosystems that will cope with the impacts of climate change um, and also providing many benefits for local people. So a really um, robust ecosystem with lots of diversity there will provide many benefits to people living near and far to that ecosystem. Very good. And so, sorry, just to pick that apart a little bit, because quite often um, it isn't mentioned the direct benefits this can have to people. Would you mind unpacking that a little bit? Yeah, do you want to take that? Yep. Yeah. Um, so as we as we know, natural ecosystems provide a whole range of benefits to people from food, really tangible things, food, fiber, timber, right the way through to spiritual, cultural benefits and so on. And the degradation of ecosystems has reduced those benefits around the world, including in, in Scotland. And it's really a, a, a kind of founding principle, I suppose, of islands rewilding and a lot of rewilding and restoration work in general, that by restoring those ecosystems, you restore the flow of benefits um, to people. As Penelope said, that can be highly local in terms of people, you know, living in those places and 
interacting with those environments, deriving direct benefits, but also nationally, globally, we, we reduce climate change impacts, we stem biodiversity loss, we give access to people more generally to natural environments. And so a, a restoration project, even of a relatively small size, can in principle provide benefits, you know, across the board to, to people. And in terms of the species and habitats, and particularly the interesting um, ecological history of Scotland, what makes it such a unique case for rewilding? Quite a lot, actually. Scotland's a really interesting place for rewilding. It's one we're one of the most nature depleted countries in the world, so we've come a long way down in a sense. Um, we have a lot of historical responsibility for climate change. You know, we've used a lot of the Earth's resources relative to other countries to produce um, national benefits and, and growth and so on. Um, and we have the capacity to repair it. You know, we're a relatively rich country. Um, we, we have a lot of um, capital in terms of knowledge and resources to turn things around with. So we have a bit of a, a responsibility to do this. But we also have enormous opportunity. You know, we've got a, a huge range of environments for a, for a small country from highly, very wet rainforest, temperate rainforest on the west coast with a, a huge um, precipitation gradient across to the east coast. Our mountains are small by European standards, but, you know, up on the top of them, you're in a, a subarctic tundra in the Cairngorms. It's a very quick um, change with elevation through different habitats. And we've also got a, a disproportionate amount of the world's carbon stores in, in our peatlands. You know, peatlands store 30% of the, the global soil carbon stock in 3% in of the area, most of which is in the Northern Hemisphere. So Scotland's, you know, a, a big hitter in terms of any of these things. So there's huge potential to, to restore and, you know, really make a difference beyond Scotland um, by doing so. And um, taking things a little bit more specific now, what are the exact projects that you guys have been working on day to day? So, um, yeah, Highlands Rewilding manages, currently manages three areas of land in Scotland. So firstly, there's Bunloyt Estate, which is where we're based, and this is by Loch Ness. And there's quite a range of habitats here. So we've got some ancient woodlands, pastures, some peatland, um, and also a few blocks of um, commercial forest. Um, and then there's um, Beldorney Estates over in Aberdeenshire near Huntley, which is more grassland dominated. And that's where we've got more regenerative agriculture, um, sort of sensitive grazing with cattle going on to restore the diversity in the grasslands there. And there's also some native woodland along the river Deveron. So that brings a restoration of riparian woodlands, which is really important um, into the mix. And then finally, there's Tavialic Estates, which is on a peninsula in Mid-Argyle. So it's very coastal. So this is where the marine research and um, some of the marine restoration work that we'd like to do in seagrass and oysters, um, that's all happening at that estate. And there's also some remnants of Atlantic rainforest here. Um, so that's quite a lot of our plans there, focus around um, restoring and expanding these little pockets of rainforest. Um, yeah, so that's sort of a brief summary of the land that we're managing at the moment. In terms of scaling, uh, what, what are we looking to, how to affect things perhaps five, ten years down, by, down the line? I think primarily through um, leading by example in a sense. I mean, how, one of Highlands Rewilding's objectives is to help other landowners to carry out nature recovery through rewilding and associated methods and and we're really working now to establish how you do that in an economically viable way so it's you know not necessarily a case of having to be a charity or having to you know spend somebody else's money somebody's own money on restoring an environment but actually using the, the economic opportunities that are out there to make that viable and we think if we can demonstrate um, how to do that robustly so it's genuinely producing the the outcomes that we want to see then that becomes an example people can use islands rewilding directly to to help manage their own land or the knowledge that we're contributing to 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 scale that up essentially so it becomes a much more likely prospect that it's carried out at larger scales and it's interesting that um that. economics always seems to be a big question around rewilding essentially making land profitable and 
what, what are some of the ways that or misgivings that people might have uh, might not see rewarding as a viable route for economic uh, you know prosperity or it might be well it, it's not basically it isn't currently you know i mean all, all of the economic drivers are towards degradation and that's why we're in such a, a, a bad situation nationally and globally you know we've seen incredibly rapid degradation of environments for the past few decades accelerating actually and it's largely because of economic pressures so when farmers and other landowners try to restore their land they're often doing it in direct opposition to the economic pressures on them and of course that has to change or we won't have rewilding restoration at, at any, any meaningful scale at all um but there are you know some opportunities perhaps emerging and also some discouraging signs generally um government public subsidies government money for nature restoration has been declining over the past few years and it seems likely that that will continue but now there is this interest in private investment um, to fund conservation and restoration which Highlands Rewilding has been set up in order to to kind of establish um and so there's the possibility that private investment could, if it's well regulated and directed um, appropriately, that it, it could help to make this much more viable. And there are also, you know, incidental or even even quite important byproducts in a sense. There's ecotourism can be a, a big income source for particular projects. Timber production remains important. Um, depending on the the use of land, there are other extractive or non-extractive services that can generate an income for projects but it's it's hard i mean i think it's hard across the board in conservation at the moment to to fund it and community is a large part of your ethos and your guiding principle do you mind uh, telling us more about that and why it's so central to your strategy so it's really a fundamental part of what we're trying to do to demonstrate that repairing those things goes together. So we're restoring the environment and also restoring socioeconomic standards as well. And to do that, we're working as closely as we can with communities local to the sites um, that Highlands Rewilding is managing. And that really means involving people in our work as much as we can. So we you know, obviously do a lot of the, the usual engagement practices like having public meetings and inviting people onto the land and, and so on but then we try to go further than that in terms of having um, direct local input into our management we have a, a local estate management board on the Tavialic estate that discusses what we're doing and, and can um, help to shape the management of it um, we work closely with that community that board and other communities in in defining what we should be trying to do so looking at the community benefits that we should be producing um, we work with local schools to deliver classes and allow you know kids to come and experience the local environment more and things like that and then of course improving access and, and even information sharing you know we've done a lot of um, ecological research on our on our sites but there's a tremendous amount of knowledge locally as well so exchanging that is a really rewarding and, and very useful process too so what we're what we're trying to do and what we're finding is that working with communities is you know a far better way to practice restoration than um than not and it delivers it, it produces benefits for for all sides in a sense that's it and as your work continues to develop and grow how would you like to see things turn out in say you know five ten year uh time frame obviously you know talking about on trees and species yeah. returning so these are often quite a slow uh so process, but how could, where could we be if things turn out quite well in the coming years? Yeah, so well, providing things go well in the current fundraising and investment round, we'd like to be continuing with our biodiversity research um, and gathering the data to monitor how things are changing as the landscapes restore. Um, and we hope to be able to provide a good example, as Callum was saying, how to do this um sort of making a, a an ethical profit um to encourage other landowners to do the same so we can see this happening at a larger scale that's it and so you just sort of alluded to it there if people wanted to get involved uh you know support your work help you fundraise donate funds of course uh, where can they find you 
islandsrewilding.co.uk is our website. There's lots of information there. Um, we're always welcoming to contact as well. People can email, get in touch and uh, and become involved. And Islands Rewilding has various social media accounts as well. Um, and locally, we're we're always open to, to see people and to, to chat about things. I see. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.